I was looking at the news and I saw uh, some kind of article uh, talking about aging with Brad Pitt in the, the picture. Uh, <clears throat> and he was talking about some sort of a, I'm not sure what you would call it, a cosmetic product or something that, that looks like it's, uh, it's related to a molecule that's found in grape seed. And so I had to find out what is that molecule they're referring to in this article. Let's go ahead and take a look a little bit more closely about uh, what they were referring to in this molecule. <clears throat> so here, here was the article that got listed in the Google News Feed. Um, it's in some sort of online publication and it said, Brad Pitt's skincare line unveils newly developed anti-aging molecule. Buddy, it's not working for you because <laughs> you look pretty old, <laughs> whatever. I, um, but what caught my attention is it talked about some unique signature molecule, GSM-10, made from Grenache grape seeds. So if I understand correctly, there's some French wine company that's wondering, what do we do with all these grape seeds? We got tons of them. Let's try to make some money off of that. And you may be in a similar situation. I mean, this is, right, how do you make money off of things that people don't recognize the value of? So I respect that. Um, <clears throat> but what do you find in grape seeds? And I didn't realize that in, in the, I don't know what you call it, the health space, there's this whole... Um, there's this whole interest in something called grapeseed extract. You can go to health stores or Sprouts Farmer's Market or something and buy pills that are labeled as grapeseed extract. And I tried to find out why anybody would think that grapeseed extract might have anything to do with aging. So in that article, there was a link back to some other previous research article that linked back to some previous research article. I was just trying to find what is, is there any evidence from anyone anywhere about grape seeds and, um, <clears throat> and, and aging. And I finally traced it all the way back to some article, I, I don't know if this is the last one in that scholarly chain, where they refer to um, grape seed extract uh, and its potential effects on cancer, cardiovascular disease, and aging process. Um, but there was no real evidence in this, in this review about what, why people would think this. But I did note that they mentioned a type of, a very specific type of molecule to, called a proanthocyanidin. And this is the core structure here of this proanthocyanidin. This is one example of many, many proanthocyanidins. Um, those particular uh, uh, varietals of grapes, I'm sure, have their own uh, variants, many of them, of proanthocyanidins. And why would you expect there'd be anything related to aging? Well, many, many people have shown that if you have hydroxy groups on benzene rings, it's well known that those inhibit radicals, oxygen radicals that can damage DNA, but there's nothing special about that. So this class of molecules, like many classes of molecules, have phenolic groups, hydroxy groups on DNA. And any time you see a hydroxy group on a benzene ring, you can expect that to inhibit oxygen radicals, to slow down DNA damage, that's not new. Every food you eat contains phenolic compounds. Every protein contains a tyrosine residue with a phenolic residue. And very often, you may not realize it, but when you eat potato chips or other foods, they've been treated with industrial chemicals produced industrially that are just as good as these proanthocyanidins. And these are all made through friedel crafts alkylation. You can see that somebody took a phenol, this core right here, and reacted it with two T-butyl carbocations in order to make those carbon-carbon bonds. And, you know, it's not clear to me that anything out of this grape e extract is better than these common preservatives, BHT and BHA, made through the venerable Friedel Crafts alkylation process. Um, but, you know, if somebody can make some money off of those leftover grape seeds, awesome. Uh, that's great. <clears throat> Okay, I wanted to return to where we left off. I gave you a bunch of rules for predicting. On, this is what we did really in our last lecture on Wednesday. I gave you a bunch of rules, powerful tools actually, for predicting the regiochemistry for electrophilic aromatic substitution. If you're adding a second substituent, if you're adding a third substituent, and then I, I left off by giving you this kind of special rule that's, wow, it's hard to do electrophilic aromatic substitution between two groups that are meta to each other. It's just sterically hindered. Uh, <clears throat> now, today, I want to talk about two completely different 
but less common mechanisms for substituting benzene rings. And I hate to cover this. I used to not cover this anywhere in Chem 51C because I thought, well, that's not very common. Why don't we just focus on the common stuff? But uh, um, <clears throat> somebody suggested that these types of questions may appear on standardized exams, so I don't feel comfortable leaving it out anymore. So let's talk about these two weird mechanisms for substituting benzene rings. And then we're going to come back and say, how do you functionalize these groups that we've been putting onto benzene rings? That's what our goal for today is. So let's talk about this weird, strange process uh, for substituting benzene rings. It's a, one of two types of nucleophilic aromatic substitution reactions. I'm going to teach you two ways that you can add nucleophiles, not electrophiles, but nucleophiles to, um, to arene rings. So everything that we've been doing so far has been these five recipes for electrophilic aromatic substitution. We have these five recipes that generate super powerful electrophiles, more powerful than any electrophiles that you've seen before. And those electrophiles will add to the aromatic pi electrons. And I'm realizing, well, this is killing me here. I drew the wrong resonance structure. So try, you have to try to fix this and put the, right? See how the arrow starts from that bond. It needs to be a double bond in the benzene rings. Sorry about that. So <clears throat> arene pi electrons can add to these super powerful electrophiles. And it's very, it's frustrating. It's frustrating because you lose aromaticity in that benzene ring. You generate these arenium ions. They've lost aromaticity. That's not a fast process. So this is the rate determining step. And then there's always some sort of a second step in this two-step mechanism where you deprotonate uh, <clears throat> the arenium ion in order to regenerate aromaticity. So we've seen this over and over again. Boy, you need to know that two-step mechanism. <laughs> if you've gone this far and you haven't learned it yet, then go back and make sure you know it. It's, it's kind of, regardless of the electrophile, it's always that two-step process. Now, what we're going to see in the next chapter is you're going to see addition, a, a lot of nucleophilic chemistry where we're focusing on nucleophiles. And we give you a class of electrophiles that's carbonyl group, C double bond O. And so we're going to start seeing reactions where you can add nucleophiles to carbonyl groups, and you push the electrons up to the oxygen of the carbonyl. You're going to see that in chapter 17. You're going to see that in chapter 18. You're going to see that in chapter 19. Guess what? That's the whole theme of chapter 20. You're going to see that in chapter 21. You're going to see, I mean, <laughs> This is the way biology works. This is the way organic chemistry works, is you add things to carbonyl groups. It doesn't occur through SN1 or SN2 or addition to alkenes. This is really the main, uh, the main way that organic chemistry works. Let's go ahead and watch, look, take a closer look at this beautiful process that you're going to see. Uh, we're going to see addition of, of nucleophiles, and we push the electrons to that electronegative oxygen. And then in a second step, these are always two-step substitution processes, then we push out the leaving group. It could be, the leaving group could be an alkoxide, could be a chloride. In this case, that would be super easy. Never one step. Now, <clears throat> unfortunately, you haven't seen this yet in all these chapters. And it, I'm going to show you a mechanism for, for aromatic substitution that looks kind of like this addition to carbonyls. So I wish we, they had moved this section on nucleophilic aromatic substitution to after chapter 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, because then it would make a lot more sense. But we're going we're gonna to follow along with the book here. And what the book tells you is that if you have either a carbonyl C double bond O, uh, like this one right here, if you have a group like this on a benzene ring, or even better, a nitro group with an N plus double bond O, <clears throat> that you can substitute leaving groups that are on those benzene rings. And it looks like those reactions look a lot like this, this, this carbonyl addition reaction. And so here's the way it works. And we now push the electrons, some of the pi electrons, up to, the, or down to, in this case, the carbonyl group. So oxygen is electronegative. It wants those electrons. So it kind of makes sense to push those electrons there. But just like electrophilic aromatic substitution, this is frustrating because it removes aromaticity. Gosh, that's not good. We just lost aromaticity. So it's not a great process. In this case that I'm showing you here, where we have a carbonyl group on the benzene ring, <clears throat> you have to heat these to get these to work. And you notice I'm adding 
to the, the ortho position and there's a leaving group there. This wouldn't substitute anything if it was an H. You can't substitute an H. So now we end up with this, I'll circle the negative charge there so you can see it. So now we end up with a negative charge on oxygen that's happy, but we've lost aromaticity that's very unhappy. And this system wants to get back aromaticity, just like an iridium ion wants to get back aromaticity. So let's go ahead and watch how this happens. We'll, we'll put a pair of electrons here on this, this is a species called an enolate. We're gonna have two full chapters on this species uh, that's called an enolate. And then we'll use these electrons to push out the leaving group in a second step. <clears throat> so it should kind of resemble all these reactions that you haven't seen. Uh, maybe in a way we're preparing you for all these carbonyl acyl substitution reactions. But this is called nucleophilic aromatic substitution. Let's go ahead and probe a little bit deeper into this uh, nucleophilic aromatic substitution process. This is the first of two types, and, and this one is called addition elimination, because we are adding first to the benzene ring with our nucleophile, and then we're eliminating out uh, a leaving group. <clears throat> All right, so what kinds of nucleophiles does this work with? Uh, you know, it, it's dependent on rate. So most commonly, this, this process is used synthetically uh, using powerful nucleophiles, hydroxide anion. You know, from what you've seen before, you might call that a powerful nucleophile. We're, we're going to show you much more powerful nucleophiles in the next chapter. But those are pretty powerful nucleophiles. Hydroxide, methoxide, ethoxide, t-butoxide, although that's hindered. Um, those are powerful nucleophiles, and thiolate anions. We don't do a lot of carbon-sulfur bond formation, but those are better as nucleophiles than alkoxides. They're not very basic, so you don't get a lot of competing elimination with thiolate anions. And then these are much more nucleophilic than amines, but amines are sometimes used in this nucleophilic aromatic substitution process. They're about a mil amines are about a million times less nucleophilic than an alkoxide or hydroxide, uh, but they're still uh, nucleophilic and one of the most common nucleophiles in biochemistry. So here's what you look for when you're trying to see, hey, am I going to see nucleophilic aromatic substitution? Here's a common substrate for nucleophilic aromatic substitution. And you'll see two groups that are picking up the electrons. I already showed you carbonyl groups. I already gave you an example where carbonyl groups are on a benzene ring, and you can push the electrons into the carbonyl. But more common than that are nitro groups. So when I see nitro benzene rings, benzene rings with nitro groups, I start looking for leaving groups that are ortho or para to the nitro. So here's an example of that over here. I've got a bromine atom that's a potential leaving group para to a nitro. And the other substitution pattern I would look for is a leaving group like chloride or bromide or fluoride ortho to a nitro group. Those are the two common patterns, more common than ortho or para to carbonyl groups. Nitroarenes are really commonly used for this nucleophilic aromatic substitution through addition elimination. Let's go ahead and draw out that two-step mechanism. Once again, it would involve the, uh, uh, some sort of a nucleophilic lone pair. And watch how far I have to push these arrows. I'm going to attack here where the leaving group is. Right? If I don't attack where the leaving group is, I'm not going to substitute anything. I have to add to the same carbon that has the leaving group. But I don't want to end up with five electrons on that, on that carbon, so I'll push the electrons here, and then I'll push the electrons to the N+. Plus, and finally, I'm going to end up putting the electrons on oxygen. Oxygen is the most electronegative atom in this whole, whole arene molecule system. So it makes sense to push the electrons onto oxygen. And let's draw this intermediate here. This intermediate, this is a lot of arrow pushing. This would make so much more sense after five chapters of adding to carbonyl groups, but we just are not there yet. And I'll end up with my methoxy group attached to the same carbon as the leaving group. And now if you look at the, my arrow pushing, my arrow pushing tells me I have to end up with this arrangement. I didn't get rid of the N+. Plus. Unfortunately, that nitrogen still has four bonds. That's going to be positively charged. But now the negative charge, let me just highlight that here. That negative charge is over here on that oxygen atom. That's great. That's great that we can put negative charge on an electronegative oxygen atom. But we lost aromaticity. OK, that sucks. We need to regenerate aromaticity. We need to get rid of that one of some kind of a leaving group. So let's take those those O minus electrons, the, these electrons right here, and let's try to push something out. I'll push this right back to the nitrogen. That's going to push these electrons over here, 
And bromide is a better leaving group than methoxide, so the bromide will leave faster. And that will regenerate aromaticity. So we've substituted bromine with a methoxy group. Boy, this is really going to make sense after a few chapters. But right now, it, it, it's going to seem, gee, this is completely different from all this electrophilic aromatic substitution. And that's true. I don't know if you've seen this reagent. It's, it, I remember learning about this when I took a biochemistry class uh, in college uh, many, many years ago. We learned about this reagent used for labeling the amino group at the end terminus of every protein. Right? Every protein is translated with an amino group at the end. Uh, I guess in, in mammalian systems, maybe it's an end formal, but in bacterial systems, you have an amino group at the end. Whoops, I didn't mean to, to draw all over that amazing amino group. So here's that amino group at the end of a long protein chain. Um, and you, there's a reagent that you can use that's good for reacting that. And you can degrade off the last uh, amino acid and analyze what was the last amino acid on the protein. And the reagent that was developed uh, was developed by this uh, Sanger. I think he won two Nobel Prizes for his work in biochemistry, understanding how to use organic reactions and biochemical reactions to sequence uh, biomolecules. And Sanger's reagent is is a reagent for doing nucleophilic aromatic substitution. It's got fluorine. Um, that's a leaving group. It's not one that you would have seen yet. Everything you've done so far has been chlorine, bromine, and iodine. But fluorine turns out to be the best for nucleophilic aromatic substitution. And notice that Sanger put not one, but two nitro groups. And of course, he put them at the ortho and para position. So this is doubly activated for nucleophilic aromatic substitution. Because there's two nitro groups, even an amino group, which is not as nucleophilic as an alkoxide, can add in here, and let's push these electrons all the way to the N plus, and then finally up to the O minus. And I could have pushed the electrons to the nitro group that's para, but uh, I'm just using, I, I, can, I have to choose one way to push the arrows for any arrow pushing step. Um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and draw that intermediate that you get. And we're not doing any, in, in this depiction, we're not doing anything with that paranitro group, but I could have pushed the electrons to the paranitro group. And my arrow pushing tells me I have to end up with a C double bond N and then two O minuses. And here's my, my, my protein amino terminus nitrogen atom is now covalently bound to that arene ring. And I'll just write protein. <clears throat> you know, you can't tell, but I'm just scared to touch the bottom of my screen down here because it, uh, on an iPad Pro, there's this bar that if you touch it slightly, the whole screen wigs out. So I, I apologize that my handwriting is not good. I, I normally have better handwriting, but I was, I'm always terrified of touching that bar because the palm recognition thing doesn't work that well, at least on my iPad. It doesn't work that well. Okay, so, uh-oh, I I've, I've didn't leave enough room here because I need one more intermediate in here. Um, and that other intermediate that I need, let me try to squeeze it in here. We have to deprotonate this uh, amino group, this ammonium ion, the N+. plus. We have to de deprotonate that. Sorry, I left out there's another N+, plus here. We have to deprotonate the uh, amine that just attacked before we kick out the leaving group. That's an essential part of this mechanism. So let me go ahead and draw out something in solution. We don't care what is in this solution. Any kind of a lone pair that is present uh, under you know, aqueous buffered conditions that they use for these Sanger labeling reactions. It could be a water molecule. It could be a carbonyl group on a protein. It could be a protein side chain, just something. We're just mechanistically trying to represent this uh, with some sort of a, a species, B, basic species that can pull off a proton. And, and that will now make a, a neutral group. And I'm sorry I didn't uh, have better organization here with my with the uh, NO2 <laughs> with, with my spacing here. Oh, boy. I didn't want a double bond there. Sorry about that if you're trying to follow along and I'm messing things up. Boy, my whole, my whole, <laughs> my whole double bond system here is totally jacked and whacked. Sorry. <laughs> Let me fix this. I've got to try to, I've got to fix those double bonds in my benzene ring so they look like before. I'm just trying to deprotonate that N plus at the top. We've got the leaving group there. That fluoride is now ready to be pushed out. And 
And the reason why it was important for us to deprotonate first before we pushed out these electrons is I'm going to draw the arrow pushing like this, where the electrons on, doesn't matter which, which O minus we use actually, is going to push out this fluoride anion through this chain. But the fact is, the reality is, there's a lone pair on this amino group now that is also helping to push out the fluoride. And that's why we had to deprotonate that N plus, because even though I didn't draw it, there's lone pairs here on this nitrogen uh, that help push the, the leaving group out. OK, so that's the, 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 the mechanism for this biochemical labeling thing. Does anybody remember covering this in Bio 98 here at UCI? If you've taken a, I don't know if they still cover. So maybe some of you might recall having seen Sanger's reagent. Uh, I don't know if the, it's, it's not really a relevant mecha mechanism for protein sequencing because now it's just so much easier to sequence the DNA and then you know the, what the translated sequence is going to be. Um, so this is kind of a 60-year-old reaction prior to DNA or nucleic acid sequencing. Okay, we're going to take a look at a second type of nucleophilic aromatic substitution. Right, uh, at the beginning of this chapter, I said you've got five recipes for electrophilic aromatic substitution. Those are the main things, right? Those are the main things for this chapter. So these two mechanisms for nucleophilic aromatic substitution are not so common, but you still need to know these mechanisms. And this one is going to freak you out and make your brain explode. Okay, so if you have uh, leaving groups on benzene rings like chloride, bromide, iodide, I, I think tosylate could in theory do this. You need better sulfonate leaving groups. And you treat them with bases, base, not nucleophile. I'm talking base here. Not just a weak base, but a powerful base like hydroxide. And not just room temperature, but look what you have to do. So if you're willing to go to these lengths, 300 degrees, you can get hydroxide to do an E2 elimination reaction on this. It's like, what? They never told us about that back in chapter 9 or whatever. They never mentioned that. Well, they never mentioned 300 degrees either. But if you're willing to do this, you can get this, this hydroxide base to deprotonate 300 degrees. You can get that to deprotonate. Um, actually, let me draw this in a different way. You know what? I don't want to describe this as an E2. I'm going to describe this as a different mechanism called E1CB. And I've got it written up above here. I don't know why I'm not uh, E1CB. And that means we have to make an anion first. And, you know, you can't just go around. Actually, I'll, I'll come back to this. You can't just go around and easily deprotonate CHs. There is a base that, that does that a little bit, to a little bit of an extent. OK, so you deprotonate. Now, that can't be a very good process, right? That's why you have to heat it to 300 degrees. This is not happening in any of the reactions that they told you about um, back in, um, in the previous chapters. And now that you have this super powerful, amazing nucleophile, you can push out the leaving group. Let me use a red, uh, a red line there for that. Boy, I hope that looks uncomfortable to you because you've never seen anything like this. And if I had shown you this I what, before today, I would have hoped you had said, there's no way that's going to happen. Look at that. It's like a triple bond in a benzene ring. You know, triple bonds like to be linear. How do you put a linear functional group into a six-membered ring? This is not happy. Boy, this is not happy. Now, fortunately, this is different from everything else I've shown you in this chapter. It is still aromatic. It still has six pi electrons. So all the unhappiness of this molecule is geometry related. It's not related to loss of aromaticity. So on the one hand, you could say, well, at least we didn't lose aromaticity. But boy, does it suck to have that strained bond, triple bond in there. And so that means under these types of reaction conditions, if you had hydroxide in the first step, that means hydroxide is still floating around and can attack this triple bond to get rid of that ring strain. And we push the electrons right back. This is kind of the reverse of what I just showed you here. And we regenerate this aryl anion. There we go. And now we just put a proton on there. Boy, this thing really wants to pick up a proton. And you can protonate that with anything. And we, we could just protonate it with water. or it, The conditions are basic, so you could write HB. That's supposed to be an H, not a K. 
and we'll just pick up a proton from water in this case. It would be, would be the, the, the uh, species in this case. Okay, so this is a second mechanism for substitution. You need insanely basic conditions for this. And there's two ways that you make the conditions insanely basic. You heat the temperature to insane temperatures, hundreds of degrees, or you use an insane base. So this is the insane temperature version of, of, of nucleophilic substitution by not addition elimination, but elimination addition. Notice we eliminate first in this mechanism. I'm trying to find my highlighter here. So this is elimination addition. We eliminate first. Boy, you need insanely basic conditions. I'm going to write that down here because I, I want you to remember this is not just regular conditions. It is insanely basic. So because of the temperature in this case, insanely basic. That's what you need. <clears throat> okay, let's go ahead and take a, a look at another version. Instead of using insane temperatures, we use an insane base. And this is a base, oddly, this is a base that you have seen before. So I want you to recall, just recall, actually let me, um, yeah, I'll just write it over here. Recall in the, in the alkynes chapter, chapter 11, we taught you about this obscure reaction where we used sodium amide anion to deprotonate alkynes. I mean, you may have thought, oh, I'm never going to see that again. Right? What we taught you is that here's this insane base that can do insane things like this. It can deprotonate alkynes. It can't deprotonate alkenes. It can't deprotonate alkanes. It's like you had no business using a crazy base like that for anything other than deprotonating alkynes. And now I'm going to show you a second use for amide anion. Right, H2N minus, nitrogen is not electronegative that much, like oxygen. Amide anion does not like that negative charge on nitrogen, and it's I, 10 to the something. What is that? Let me do a quick... It's like 10 to the 20. 10 to the 20 more basic than hydroxide. So this is an insane base. You've seen it before. Maybe you didn't appreciate how basic that was. And when we use this insane base, sodium amide, we can run these reactions at room temperature or below. So if you're willing to use something that's 10 to the 20 more basic than hydroxide, now we don't need to heat to hundreds of degrees. So let's go ahead and take a look at what's happening here. So uh, I'm not going to draw out the whole mechanism for the elimination addition. I just showed you the two-step mechanism. Uh, but the mechanism is going to start off with deprotonation here. Uh, <clears throat> right? You take your insane base like this, you deprotonate, and then in a second step, you push out the fluoride leaving group. Let's go ahead and draw that intermediate. And the reason why you don't see this used that often is I'll show you why. Because we end up making uh, uh, two different benzyne intermediates. And I'll show you the first one that comes from my arrow pushing. Right? My, the arrow pushing that I showed is going to generate this benzyne intermediate right here, this one. Right? <clears throat> and the problem with this reaction is Okay, what's our nucleophile going to be? Well, it's going to be amide anion. And amide anion can come back in and add right back to where um, that leaving group left. Let me go ahead and do that down below here. So amide anion, these conditions have a lot of amide anion in there. The amide anion can add right back to where that fluoride leaving group left from. But notice, you could also add from the top of that alkyne. There's nothing stopping that 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 amide anion that's floating around in there from adding to the top. So some of the product in this reaction, I'm, I'm going to use a blue pen. I don't know if you can tell if this is blue. Um, let me break. I don't know. That looks kind of black still. I just didn't want to use that. And we can now add from the top. And those are both equally good. So if you add from, um, add from the top, you know, we're going to get this isomer shown over here. And if you add from the bottom of that alkyne, you're going to end up with this isomer shown over here. I mean, you get this, this mixture. You cannot control it, and you're going to get that mixture. But the problem is, in our starting material, there was another H that you could have removed, and that's down below. There's no reason that you couldn't have pulled off the H from the bottom of this benzene ring. And if you pull off that H, you'll get a completely different benzene intermediate. So you'd also get a benzene intermediate, and you can't stop this that's floating around and, and looks like... Whoops, let me, I have to do a different resonance structure here. I've got to put the triple bond down here. So in that reaction mixture, you're going to have two different benzene intermediates. If you start with a substituted benzene ring, 
if your error, if your benzyne is has a substituent on there, you now have to worry about which end of the triple bond you add to, and you have to worry about which benzyne intermediate your regiochemistry you're generating. So there's amide anions could add to either end of this benzyne intermediate, and we just don't have any control over that. So one possibility would be to add to the bottom here, ortho to the phenyl, and the other possibility, I'm trying to add in blue, uh, is adding to the, um, whoops, that's a lame looking arrow, is, is adding to the, uh, man, I got so many arrows here, I don't even know how to, <laughs> I got so many arrows floating around. I, you get the idea, right? If you've got an alkyne, you can add to either end. And it's strained. That's why you can add to the alkyne. Normal alkynes, you can't just add nucleophiles to alkynes, but this is a super strained, unhappy alkyne. So this is a problem with this, the utility of this. It's not very useful. And you almost always see it on just monosubstituted fluorobenzene or chlorobenzene. Because as soon as you have a second substituent, now you're worried about, well, I got all these regioisomers in here. So you get all these different, I got to track through this, like you get all these different regioisomeric products in here, and it's like, what a, what a nightmare. I don't typically like to ask you questions on my exams where there's four different products or three different products, because I don't like grading all of that. And it doesn't get used very often in the lab, because nobody likes separating things. OK, so this is the second type of mechanism for nucleophilic aromatic substitution. It is elimination addition, and that elimination requires insanely basic conditions. OK, <clears throat> sorry for that little shortcut. The, the, the author of the book put this right in the middle of the chapter. And now let's get back to kind of electrophilic aromatic substitution. That's really the meat of this chapter. Um, and what I, I want to bring you to is, once you put a substituent on a benzene ring, what kinds of, of things can you do with that substituent? I mean, if you can only put five substituents on there, if I only taught you five recipes, what about all the other hundred functional groups? How do, we, how do we take those five substituents and convert them into other functional groups? And the book has lots of problems for you to work, checking to see if you can design synthetic se sequences. Now, I want to take you back to, there was a chapter on radicals. I think it was chapter 15. Trying to, oh, yeah, it says it here, chapter 15 that talks about some radical reactions. And one of the reactions that they taught you about was allylic bromination. And we had a question on this this week in our discussion section where allylic bromination could be useful, where you want to have an H uh, uh, allylic to an alkene and then replace it with a leaving group. And you can do E2 elimination or SN2 or, or SN1 with once you put a leaving group on a benzene ring. So how do you take a CH and put a leaving group on there? And for allylic bromination, the, there was really only one set of conditions that were useful, and that was n-bromosuccinamide and some sort of a radical initiator. So n-bromosuccinamide was our key reagent. We couldn't use Br2 because that would just add to the double bond. So the problem with allylic bromination is that when you pluck off one of these H's using a radical, right, the, the mechanism of the reaction involves form, forming an allylic radical, there's resonance. I can draw the, a resonance structure for this where the radical is here in the middle, or I can draw a resonance structure where the radical is on the end. And when you trap that allyl radical out uh, with, with a bromine atom, you end up getting a mixture of two different allylic bromides. What a useless piece of junk. That's why we haven't been using that reaction since then. Nobody wants reactions that generate horrible mixtures of stereoisomers and regioisomers and the double bonds in different places. But we're going to take that same reaction, the same reaction conditions, and we're going to use that to do something that's useful that only gives one product. We're going to take the alkyl groups that you've been putting on benzene rings, like an ethyl group, a propyl group, an isopropyl group, um, a cyclohexyl group, and we're going to show you how to put a leaving group on there using exactly the same radical conditions. If you take those allylic bromination conditions, n bromosuccinamide, and we symbolize light using H nu, you know that equation E equals H nu from physics, just the indicating the energy of a, that's, a, that's not a V, it's a Greek symbol nu, N, N U. Um, so H nu, um, and that allows us to replace useless hydrogens that are benzylic, right? Uh, not here, right? That's not, not there, but here, right? We're replacing the benzylic hydrogens, the ones that are directly adjacent to the benzene ring and putting leaving groups on there. And that's useful. 
Wow, that is useful. Because now you can do eliminations and make alkenes. You can do SN2 reactions and substitute them with cyanothiol, potentially al alkoxide. That's very useful to, because you can't directly introduce a bromoalkyl group using electrophilic aromatic substitution. If you wanted to make this, you would have to do friedel crafts alkylation and then use this radical bromination. Now, there, fortunately, you don't have to worry about adding Br2 to the double bonds of benzene rings. right? If you just mix this thing here with Br2, nothing will happen. And so there's another set of simpler conditions that never would have worked with a simple alkene. Um, and that's just using Br2 and light. And I think those are the conditions the book favors. Unfortunately, telling you that you could use any of these conditions just makes things confusing. I'm just going to tell you. I like. I, if I can pick any conditions, I like to pick the simplest ones. I mean, how many of you remember the structure for n bromo 6 -cinamid? It wasn't important. We just ask you to memorize the recipe. Uh, so the conditions that I like to, to use that are the simplest is Br2 and the Greek symbol H nu. So that's, that's the conditions I like. They're simpler to me than n bromo 6 -cinamid, NBS, uh, and H nu. Any one of these conditions here would work. NBS and H nu, Br2 and H nu, Br2 and heat, uh, n bromo 6 -cinamid and heat, n bromo 6 -cinamid and, and peroxides, and they don't tell you it's benzoyl peroxide every time. Um, they, they put that in acne medication. I don't know why they don't want to tell you. Uh, so I, I tend to like... Um, I tend to like this one right here. This is the, this one, it just seems simpler to me, and I like to try to keep things simpler. So I think the book prefers that, and I use that too. Okay, but they, will, they would all work. <clears throat> all right, so you can put leaving groups on there and then substitute away. And like I told you in the next chapter, I'm going to teach you how to change that bromine atom into the most nucleophilic bond in, in, that you will have seen. It's... So, and that's really the, the utility of a halogen to me, is turning it into a nucleophile, not doing messy E2, SN2, E1. That's a mess. Okay, <clears throat> so let's go ahead and take a look at some other reactions, another key reaction that the book just seems to have this endless fascination with, with this transformation. And, and the transformation is to take a carbonyl group, and this is not just aryl ketones, but that's since we're telling you how to make aryl ketones, and then burning these aryl ketones down. Whoops, let me use a, a try to use a highlighter here. Burning this aryl ketone down to a CH2 group. And normally we don't draw the H's on there. And that turns out to be pretty useful. Right? And I'm going to give you two recipes for this. And I just hate it when the book gives you two recipes. It doesn't explain. It's like, why give you twice as many things to learn if you're not going to tell people when one is better than the other? Uh, I'm, I'm going to try to explain to you why you might want to choose one over the other, but typically the book isn't asking you these cases. When I, in the laboratory, apply these two reduction conditions, and they have names. This one on top here, they, they require brutal conditions. This one on top is called a wolf kirchner reduction. Uh, sometimes called a Huang Min Lone reduction. You don't need to know the name. You just need to know hydrazine. That's basically rocket fuel. They used to put rockets into space. Very reactive. Sodium hydroxide. Uh, and then you heat the heck out of it. You boil it for hours and hours and hours and hours under strongly basic conditions. So that's the basic conditions one. Strongly basic. Insanely basic. And then there's another set of conditions that the book gives you. This is called a Clemenson reduction, where you take this species called zinc mercury amalgam, and then you boil it in hydrochloric acid for hours and hours and hours. What is this ZNHG? What is that? It's like it's so mysterious looking. They just take zinc powder. You could take a bar of zinc metal and file it down to make powder, but it's the surface of those zinc particles is not reactive enough. So they soak it with a mercury solution to coat the particles with mercury, and that makes these zinc particles very reactive. And we always write it zinc, Z-N, parentheses, H-G. And we say zinc, mercury, amalgam when we do that. It's, um, you don't need to worry about but you have to draw it out as zinc, parentheses, H-G. Z-N, parentheses, H-G, that's the only way. So what are the implications that you've got two strongly reactive conditions, one strongly basic and one strongly acidic? So the implications are that if I had a, something that was sensitive to acidic conditions, like this, right, a tertiary alcohol, 
boy, you do not want to expose that to concentrated HCl and heat it. Right? This, you learned all about SN1 and, and E1 and why that would react very quickly if you expose this to hydrochloric acid. So this would be no problem if you did the basic conditions because you're not going to eliminate under basic conditions. But if you tried to put that into those acidic conditions down below, game over. You're just going to get an awful mixture, a horrible mixture with, with carbocations floating around and everything. So if you have substituents that are sensitive to either acid or base, then you have to carefully choose which of these two conditions you use. And if you do not have uh, any substituents that are susceptible to acid or base, then it doesn't matter which condition. You, you pick the one you like. Pick your favorite and make that your go-to reagent for reducing carbonyl groups down. Now, unfortunately, in the next chapter, I'm going to teach you a different way to reduce down the carbonyl groups of esters to CH2 groups. Uh, but for this chapter, just remember, it's going to get a little bit confusing. For this chapter, remember that if you have an ester or an amide, so if you have this, these types of groups here, like an alkoxy on that carbonyl or an amino group on the carbonyl, you cannot use these two conditions. We will give you a, a set of conditions in the next chapter that are different for reducing carbonyls down to CH2 when there's an oxygen there. So uh, in reality, if I, if I had to memorize just one of these, let's suppose I just could not memorize two of these. This is the one I prefer because there's so many substituents that are susceptible to acid. Acids can react with alkenes. Acids can react with alkynes. Acids can react with alcohols. Acids can protonate ethers. And so the, the, the acidic Clemenson reduction condition, zinc mercury amalgam, they're less useful because there's so many types of functional groups that are not uh, compatible with, with strong acids. So, um, but, but every once in a while, you'll have something that's susceptible to base, and you have to use those acidic conditions. OK, <clears throat> let's show you how to strategically use this. And the back of the chapter, I want you to work the problems in the back of the chapter. I assume you have worked those problems, and you are working problems in the back of the chapter to get re ready for my exams. And there are lots of reactions like this, or lots of strategic reactions where, let's just suppose you, you wanted to, I'll, let's just skip down to the bottom here. Let's suppose you wanted to take benzene and add a four-carbon group called an isobutyl group on there. You cannot do friedel crafts reaction to put that there in one step. And let me explain why. Because if you take isobutyl chloride and you take aluminum trichloride, I want you to recall what happens. Those conditions for friedel crafts generate initially primary carbocations. But remember I told you primary carbocations will rearrange. They'll undergo one, two shifts to form more stable carbocations. You could migrate a methyl to give a secondary carbocation, but it's faster to migrate, in this case, a hydrogel group because it gives you a tertiary. You can't stop that. It's faster than any reaction with benzene. And so lickety split, you're going to have T-butyl carbocations floating around. You can't stop that from happening. And so what is it that adds to the benzene ring? It's T-butyl carbocations. And you will not get that substitution pattern that you wanted. You'll end up with a T-butyl group on there. So if you want to put an isobutyl group on a benzene ring, you've got to plan very carefully, right? If you want to put that on a benzene ring, you have to do a friedel crafts acylation. Step one, you do a friedel crafts acylation, and you put on a carbonyl group that you don't even want. And then step two, right, initially, uh, so initially that would put a carbonyl group here. And then step two, we're going to use one of those two reduction conditions that I just showed you. You could do the hydrazine, H2N, and H2 one, or you can do the zinc mercury amalgam one. Doesn't matter because there's nothing on here is, is susceptible to acid or base. And so I'm going to choose the, the hydrazine conditions, the, what's called a wolf kieschner reduction. H2N and H2, there's an NN bond there. Sodium hydroxide. That's a real reagent. I can't just write hydroxide. And you heat the heck out of this. You boil it. I'll use a delta symbol there. It's 100 degrees because it's actually done in water for hours and hours and hours. And you'll end up in converting that carbonyl group that you didn't really want into a CH2 group that you did want. And this two-step process would be efficient. 
So if I ask you how to make that from benzene, and the book has lots of questions like, take benzene and make Viagra or something like that. And you have to properly choose the sequence of, of reactions to, to, get to, the, to get to the product. All right, <clears throat> this idea that you have to very carefully plan out the, the, the sequence of reactions is a big theme for this chapter, right? Not this coming Monday, but the next Monday, we're going to have an exam. And I'm going to expect you to have worked problem after problem where you have care very carefully planned out the correct sequence of reactions to efficiently put two or three substituents on a benzene ring or some weird substituent that you can't add in one step using our five recipes. So let's go ahead and... Um, Actually, let me show you one more reaction before we start talking about that just general planning. And boy, this one is money because we're going to see this again in chapter 23. I promise you, you'll see this again in chapter 23. And I'll remind you, remember that reaction I showed you from chapter 16 and you'll go, oh yeah. So we don't really want typically nitro groups on benzene rings if you're making drugs for certain. Um, what we really want to do is take that nitro group and convert it into an amino group. And we'll show you all kinds of reactions you can do with that amino group. And the conditions for doing this are surprising. The conditions for converting nitro groups to amino groups are hy uh, hydrogen gas and palladium on carbon. Those are exactly the same conditions for reducing alkenes to alkanes. They are exactly the same conditions for reducing CC triple bonds to alkanes. You already know these conditions. Who would have thought that you could reduce a nitro group? And, and break nitrogen-oxygen bonds. You would never have guessed that. And these reactions are so amazing. You always get 100% yield. The only byproduct is H2O, and you, you usually work things up using aqueous workups anyways. So there's essentially no carbon byproducts in, in this reaction. It's amazing. You only need a catalytic amount of palladium on carbon powder to put in there. Now, the book gives you a second set of conditions that you can use. And they don't really explain why it's important to, to use these. Why would they tell you a second set of conditions if they're not explaining why they're important? And I'll explain why they're important. So the second set of conditions you can use are tin and hydrochloric acid. Just tin powder. Take a bar of tin and file it down and then take the, the metal powder, the tin powder. And when you mix that in hydrochloric acid, you can use that to reduce nitro groups. Now, unfortunately, those reaction conditions because you're doing it in HCl, the HCl will protonate your amine. So your true product is this ammonium chloride salt. We're going to talk a lot more uh, about acid-base chemistry of amines in chapter 23, but we're not doing that now. If you want to convert this uh, to the amino group like I asked over here, like I've depicted, we have to work this up using sodium hydroxide. We have to deprotonate that ammonium salt. And if you don't draw that, then you won't get an amino group. You'd end up with an ammonium chloride salt. Now, why is this ever better than this one-step H2 palladium and carbon? The thing that the book doesn't tell you is that H2 and palladium on carbon can easily cleave carbon-halogen bonds. And so you can't... So in a case, if you have some carbon bromine, so I'll write carbon Br, Cl, iodine, you know, that's... so. If you just happen to have one of those halogens on your ring, you'd need to use this tin reduction method. And I think the book even mentions a third reaction, like iron and hydrochloric acid. There's just no reason for you to ever use that. Or why not just do tin? Just memorize one. Okay, so it's kind of obscure. You're probably never going to run into a case. I can't remember in the book if you're running into a case where there's a carbon halogen bond that you don't want to reductively cleave. Uh, H2 and palladium on carbon is the number one set of conditions for this. This one right, th these conditions right here are the conditions you really want. Okay, so when we come back on uh, Monday, I'm just going to briefly mention, um, <clears throat> you know, this idea that there's a strategy issue involved. You have to cor pick the correct sequence many times for how to go from benzene to something that has three substituents that you really want. And you need to go practice problem after problem uh, in the book to, to know how to work those because you won't be able to guess it just by understanding my notes. You've got to practice it. All right. Uh, I have office hours right now. I'm going to go right back to my office. So my study hall, uh, originally, uh, I had some scheduling issues that I had to resolve. Uh, my study hall was originally at 11 o'clock, but now I'm changing them to 9 a.m. On, on, um, on Fridays.